Good morning. You can be taking your Bible out and turning to Psalm 14. Psalm 14 will be the focus of our study and meditation on God's Word for the next few minutes, and you'll benefit by seeing that text in front of you as we look at it together. Psalm 14. We've talked some in our reflections on the Psalms up to this point about the different types of Psalms or the categories of Psalms. Of course, those categories are in some way arbitrary, but what they do is they help us to understand what the main point or the main expression of the Psalm is. Is it a Psalm of praise primarily? Is it a Psalm of thanksgiving? One of the types of psalms that we've seen a lot of up to this point is called a psalm of lament. It is a psalm in which the author is crying out to God, addressing a prayer to God. Oftentimes the psalmist is being oppressed by enemies or the wicked people are making his life difficult. And so he is asking God for relief. Do something about this, O God. Well, Psalm 14 is going to kind of feel like a psalm of lament, but it doesn't quite fit exactly into that category. There's not really a direct prayer to God for relief, and there's no real clear indication that presently the author is in some type of distress. You could compare Psalm 14 to what's called a wisdom psalm. The A very classic example of a wisdom psalm is Psalm 1. If you remember Psalm 1, which we've talked a lot about this year, Psalm 1 is really just describing the world, right? It's describing the wicked and what they're like. It's describing the righteous person and what he is like. And it is explaining that the righteous person is blessed and the wicked person will be punished, cut off from the congregation of God's people. And the the point of the psalm is is to give some wisdom. And to teach the reader or the worshiper which of those paths to follow. Well, we kind of see that sort of thing here in Psalm 14. As the wicked will be described, the righteous will be described. But it doesn't quite fit into the category of a wisdom psalm either. But I want us to hold these two things in front of us. I want us to see that Psalm 14 is describing the world of a psalm of lament. Describing a world in which things are not really the way that they should be, and that is difficult. At the same time, I do want us to notice the wisdom. We'll even see the language of wisdom and folly and understanding and knowledge in this psalm. Notice the wisdom that the psalmist is offering about the present reality and about a future reality. Let's read this psalm together and then uh, go through it and reflect on what it means for us as Christians in the 21st century. Psalm 14, to the choir master of David. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. Have they no knowledge? All the evildoers who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call upon the Lord? There they are in great terror, for God is with the generation of the righteous. You would shame the plans of the poor, but the Lord is his refuge." Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion when the Lord restores the fortunes of his people. Let Jacob rejoice. Let Israel be glad. We begin in the first few verses with a description of the wicked. Psalm 14 and verse 1 is kind of famous. You may remember hearing this at some point. The fool says in his heart, There is no God. A couple of things to clarify, especially in our modern context. One of those is that in the wisdom literature of the Bible, think about a book like Proverbs being the the, the wisdom literature. In the wisdom of the Bible, the fool 
is not necessarily someone who is unintelligent. They may be very intelligent. Instead, the fool in the Bible is the one who is stubborn and who is selfish. The fool is the one who is going to do things his way and doesn't care what anyone else has to say about it. He's going to live life the way that he wants to live it. He's not going to listen to advice. He's not going to listen to the wisdom of God. He's going to do what he wants to do. The fool is stubborn and selfish. The other thing to clarify about Psalm 14 and verse 1 is that what's in view here is not necessarily the philosophical atheist that we think of today. The person who will profess and will claim based on their own reasons that there is no God, right? That God doesn't exist, that there is no supernatural. That kind of thing didn't exist, really. There was nobody like that in the ancient world. Everybody would have claimed belief or, or said to believe in some sort of supernatural, some sort of deity. And notice that the fool here is not necessarily saying this out loud. The fool is saying this in his heart. And so this person may even profess to believe in the God of Israel. And yet in their heart, they leave God out. They push God out intentionally. There's language like this back in Psalm 10 that I think is, is, is clarifying for us. Psalm 10 and verse 4 talks about the wicked, prideful man. All his thoughts are, there is no God. But then in Psalm 10 verse 11, he says in his heart, God has forgotten. He has hidden his face. He will never see it. And then in Psalm 10 verse 13, why does the wicked renounce God and say in his heart, you will not call to account. That's what's going on in Psalm 14, verse 1. The fool who is stubbornly insistent on his own selfish way of living, he thinks in his heart, God's not going to hold me accountable for my actions. I can do what I want without consequence. Think about this again in terms of the wisdom literature. If the beginning of wisdom, according to Proverbs, is the fear of the Lord, acknowledgement of his power and his authority, then the essence of folly is to deny the reality that God is creator and judge. And the result of that in verse 1 of Psalm 14 is that they are corrupt. This word is used again in verse 3. And this word corrupt is the same word used of the world of Noah in Genesis 6, verse 11 and 12. And it's the same word used in Exodus 32 and verse 7 to describe the actions of the people of Israel when they built and worshipped the golden calf while Moses was on Mount Sinai. And both of these stories, the Noah story and the golden calf story, display what Psalm 14 verse 1 refers to as abominable deeds, a lifestyle that God detests, that he hates. And these two stories also, the flood and the golden calf, display the universality of the folly that the psalmist is describing. Everybody in the world of Noah was caught up in this. All of Israel was worshiping that golden calf. And in the same way, Psalm 14, verse 1, there is none who does good. And so in verse 2, the Lord looks down from heaven. This reminds us of the Tower of Babel story, right? In Genesis 11, they were rebelling against God, doing what they wanted to do. Let's make a name for ourselves. God comes down to see the little blocks that they're playing with. The Lord comes down, Psalm 14 and verse 2, on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, any who seek after God. Verse 3, they have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. There is a, a, a single Hebrew word that in English we have the words, there is no. One Hebrew word that means there is no. And that word shows up four times here in these first three verses. The foolish humans say there is no God, verse 1. But then from God's vantage point, verse 1, there is no one who does good. Again in verse 3, there is no one who does good. There is no not even one. And so we come to verse 4. And this is where this starts to feel especially like a psalm of lament. But notice the psalmist is not so much crying out for help as much as he is just expressing his own confusion. 
his own puzzlement over the state of things. Don't they get it? (laughs) Have they no knowledge, these evildoers who eat up my people as bread? As we've seen before, the result of this prideful arrogance and selfishness is the harm of other people. Other people, innocent, needy people suffer because of the actions of these foolish evildoers. And they do it casually. They don't even think about it, right? They eat up poor people for breakfast. They eat my people as they eat up bread and do not call upon the Lord. If you think about one of those classic expressions of wisdom in the book of Proverbs that you're familiar with, from Proverbs 3, starting in verse 5, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make straight your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. We see the exact opposite here in Psalm 14. These people trust in themselves within their heart. They lean on their own understanding. They do not acknowledge God. They do not call upon him. They are wise in their own eyes. They do not fear the Lord. And they are given over to evil. And so instead of the result of Proverbs 3 and verse 8, it will be healing wisdom. Trusting in God will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Instead of that, verse 5 of Psalm 14, there they are in great terror. See, God is a faithful God. He's faithful to his word. He's faithful to his promises. He's faithful to his people. And so he continues to be on the side of those who are Righteous, verse 5, he continues to be a refuge for those who humbly trust in him, verse 6. Even though the world, verse 6, would try to shame God's people and destroy them, God, Yahweh, is a refuge for them. And so the psalm ends then in verse 7 with uh, the closest thing perhaps to a prayer, a longing that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion, that God would would turn things around, that he would restore the fortunes of his people. You think about the book of Proverbs, and what Proverbs is doing, what the wisdom literature of the the Bible is doing, is describing the world as God created, created in its ideal. We sometimes talk about the spiritual physics of the book of Proverbs, that God has created the world according to wisdom, and so when you live according to God's wisdom, generally... Things work out. There is blessing. There is life. But if you live contrary to God's wisdom, against the grain of life, then there is difficulty and there is hardship. That's kind of the ideal, the the theoretical of Proverbs that that is usually true. And the psalmist in Psalm 14 seems to know that and trust in that. But at the moment, things are not looking quite that way. And so he ends his prayer He ends his psalm by by, by praying or longing that God would set things right, turn things around, bring salvation for Israel out of Zion, restore the fortunes of your people so that Jacob can rejoice, that Israel can be glad. So, Psalm 14 is, is perhaps not quite a typical lament. But clearly, Psalm 14, as we've said, is a description of a fallen world. And in this description of the fallen world in Psalm 14, there is wisdom that the author is trying to communicate to us. So, let's end by asking this question. What does Psalm 14 teach us about our world that we are living in now in the 21st century? And what does Psalm 14 teach us about our place in the world in which we live? The first thing we would say about our world in light of Psalm 14 is that we ourselves have denied God and called it wisdom. We have denied God and called it wisdom. We could say we have killed God and called it wisdom. This was the language that was used by the philosophers of the 20th century to say that, well, we've really advanced, we've developed past any need for God. And with the developments of modern technology and of science and the things that we figured out philosophically, the reason that we are able to perform as humans and the things that we're able to explain and figure out, there really is no need for God. And so really over 
the last several centuries, this process has been playing out where more and more in the world of science or the world of, of politics, how people ought to behave in society, in education, even in discussions of, of personal life and, and how to find personal fulfillment or personal morality. In all these areas, in normal society, any concept of God is removed, especially as removed from being the center point, and in many cases removed altogether. And again, we see this as a society, we see this as progress, right? And if you try to, to bring God back into the discussion, say, hey, we're going to do science, but let's, let's, let's start with the fact that God created the world. <laughs> That's laughable. That's ignorance. We've developed past that. We are more enlightened now. Because we realize, we have learned, we've discovered that we're really on our own. It's up to us. We can do it. There is no need for religion. There is no need for the supernatural. There is no need for God. We have denied God and called it wisdom. Now, there's many factors in this, and books upon books have been written about these developments over the last several centuries. But somewhere in there, and I think at the heart of it, is something that is not unique to modern man at all. It's simply the age-old desire to do what we want to do and not be held accountable for it. And humans have always been that way, going back, well, really to Genesis 3, and especially as we saw Genesis chapter 11. We want to do what we want to do. And none of us, in this room or elsewhere, none of us are exempt from this. We have all said in our heart, there's no God. We've all said in our heart, I will not give account. I will not be accountable for my actions. And we have all chosen that way of rebellion. And my guess is that we all understand that intuitively. But unless you need some convincing... I will point out, and maybe the language of Psalm 14, 1 to 3, seemed familiar to you for this reason. The Apostle Paul quotes uh, from this first half of Psalm 14 in Romans chapter 3, towards the end of this argument that he is making that the wrath of God is revealed against all unrighteousness, and that everyone, Jew and Gentile alike, is guilty of this unrighteousness. And is deserving of the wrath of God. Romans 3 and verse 9, picking up in Paul's argument here, he says, What then? Are the Jews better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jew and Greek, are under sin. As it is written, and then listen to this, None is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. That's Psalm 14. And Paul says that it applies to all of us. All of us have pushed God out of the equation in our hearts and lived the way that we want to live. And like the world around us, we've done that and think, thought that we were wise for doing so. Again, this goes back to Proverbs 3, verse 5 through 7. We have trusted in ourselves, in our hearts. We have leaned on our own understanding. We have lived our lives without acknowledging God. And in all of that, we have been wise in our own eyes. We've thought, I'm doing the right thing. I'm doing the smart thing by leaning on my understanding, by trusting in myself and what I can accomplish. We've denied God and we've called it wisdom. What Paul says earlier in Romans, Romans 1.22, is true of the world and it is true of us. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. And that is what Psalm 14 is saying. It is utter foolishness to deny the reality of God. It is utter foolishness to live as if God will not see as if God will not hold us accountable. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1, that the wisdom of the world, what seems so brilliant and so intuitive in the world's way of thinking, is foolishness 
before God. And again, that describes all of us. We have all darkened our hearts and darkened our lives through a stubborn, rebellious foolishness. And because of that, we have brought God's wrath upon ourselves. We have denied God, called it wisdom, and become lost in our foolishness. And yet, the second thing that we will reflect on from Psalm 14 is that in Christ, we have a refuge. It's one of the things that we have tried to see in all of the Psalms. In fact, Jesus says himself in Luke 24, verse 44, after his resurrection, that all of the law, the prophets, and the Psalms, he says, are about him and are fulfilled in him. And so we see Jesus and the salvation of Jesus here in Psalm 14, that in Christ we have a refuge and we have a hope. If you went back to that passage in Romans chapter 3, that's really the end where we read earlier, where Paul quotes Psalm 14 to say that all have sinned. Paul is wrapping up his arguments that all have sinned to move on to say in Romans 3, 23, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption of that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. Jesus, as we have remembered around the Lord's table this morning, has been put forward as a atoning sacrifice, his blood to cover over our sin, to deliver us from the wrath of God, to give us a refuge, to save us from ourselves. To save us from our own foolishness. If we will, like Psalm 14 says, if we will put our trust in him, if we will take refuge in him, we have a refuge in Christ. So we have a refuge from our own foolishness, from our own sin. But then if you look at Psalm 14, we would recognize that even for the righteous person, even for the one who is trusting in the Lord and taking refuge in the Lord, life is still difficult because things are not as they should be. This is still a fallen world. And we find ourselves in that situation. Again, Psalm 14 and verse 6, the wicked would try to shame the plans of the poor. The world continues in what it seems to be, what it thinks of as wisdom. And the people of God suffered some degree for that. Even if we are not experiencing outright persecution, even still we live in a world in which Christians are kind of, you know, maybe on one hand patted on the head and said, well, that's nice, you know, that's cute that you still have your old-fashioned beliefs and you believe in God and all that kind of stuff. And you can do that if you want, but in real normal society, you know, we're, gonna, we're not going to take that. We're going to make the decisions and, and kind of operate based on the enlightened understanding of our secular age. But, you know, that's nice, right? Or Christians are viewed with more hostility than that and say, how dare you still believe and still try to tell other people these ignorant, outdated, disproven notions that there's a God and that Jesus is the Son of God. Ignorant and it's dangerous. Either way... The world tries to shame the plans of the poor. And I would say from Psalm 14 that, again, our refuge is in Christ. And part of what that means is that we're just going to have to be okay with looking that way to the world and with the world treating us that way. This is much of Paul's point in that passage in 1 Corinthians 1 that I referenced earlier. Paul says the word of the cross, our message, is folly. It is foolishness to those who are perishing. The world thinks it's ridiculous, ignorant, outdated, what it is that we believe and what it is that we proclaim. We're just going to have to be okay with that because our refuge is not in the world and our hope is not in fitting in with the world or having a message that is more tolerable or palatable to the world. Instead, we put our hope in Christ. We put our trust in Christ. He is our refuge in this fallen world and in Christ, not only do we have a refuge from our own sin, in Christ we have a refuge from 
the opposition we might face in the world. In Christ, we have hope that all things will be set right. And we can trust in that earnest expectation. And really, verse 7 of Psalm 14 is our longing as well. And we can express along with the psalmist, Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion when the Lord restores the fortunes of his people. Let Israel rejoice and be glad. This is what we are waiting for as well. The New Testament writers will say, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. Oh, that salvation would come. Oh, that the king would return. Because when he returns, everything will be fixed. Everything will be restored. Justice will be served. Relief will be given to those who have taken refuge in him. The fortunes of his captive people will be restored once and for all. And so in Christ we have a refuge and in Christ we have a hope. No matter what we experience here and now. And so we'll conclude with the words of Paul in 2 Thessalonians 1. Speaking to a people that have been opposed in the world because of their faith in Christ. Paul says, God will grant relief to you who are afflicted. As well as to us. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels and flaming fire. Inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. And so the call as we close, the call that we try to give as often as we can in these assemblies, is to obey the gospel. Which means to obey, to submit to the news, the good news that Jesus is king. It means to bow the knee. And that begins in baptism, a pledge of allegiance to King Jesus, an obedience toward, of his command and the command of his apostles to be joined to his death and to be joined to his burial and his resurrection, to be raised to walk in newness of life, but then to do what you've signed up for. Continue to bow the knee every day in submission to the king, to obey his commands, to walk in his light. That's the call. Obey the good news. He is able to deliver you from whatever mess you have made of your life. And so don't wait any longer to put your refuge in him. Or if there's anyone else here that's done that, but needs the help of this congregation to walk the way that the king has told us to walk as we wait for his return, we want to help you as well. But let's sing one more song of encouragement. If you need something from us, please come to the front while we stand and sing.